in pursuit of health and wisdom. Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey. Sapio with Buck Joffrey is this show, and uh, today is going to be a little bit of a solo show. I'm going to speak on a on a topic I think is uh, for those of you who are sort of in this space. It was uh, is kind of a hot topic. It's a, a very uh, interesting uh, series of events that we've had in the last uh, week. Let me tell you about it. I've spoken uh, multiple times now about intermittent fasting. Uh, specifically the type of intermittent fasting that I'm uh, referring to is time-restricted feeding. In other words, on a daily basis, you don't, uh, you, you have a window. In my case, that window is I, you know, typically eat probably within six or seven hours. And that window is for me somewhere between one and say 7 p.m. I do that because uh, there was, you know, a lot of, and we'll get into this, there is a lot of evidence uh, that there was uh, some health benefits to that. Now, there was recently a meeting of the American Heart Association that suggested that uh, it may not be such a good idea based on some of those results, and we're going to dive into that momentarily. However, before we do that, I want to spend some time reviewing what we actually do know about the benefits of this uh, thing that we call intermittent fasting uh, from the literature up to this point and uh, sort of get to uh, get to the explanation of why me and I, I think a, a number of other people in the longevity space have really made uh, intermittent fasting a, a part of that, the cornerstone of what they're doing. Uh, so first of all, let's let's make some definitions, some, some clarify some definitions so there's no confusion. First of all, intermittent fasting is not the same thing as calorie restriction. So calorie restriction, uh, CR, means daily caloric intake without malnutrition. That's an important one. You got to make sure you get all your, your macronutrients and stuff. There's, it's important. And Caloric restriction in this context has shown, not surprisingly, to decrease body weight. But specifically, the thing that um, caloric restriction has shown pretty much across species, multiple species, including non-human primates, as an increase in longevity. In other words, caloric restriction appears to make you live longer right, across the species. And in fact, some of the initial discoveries of even some of the, the pathways of longevity were based on this uh, concept of caloric restriction uh, in worms. I, I don't want to get into that too much, but bottom line is that that is a, a major part of what so thought to uh, initiate uh, or uh, uh, stimulate some of these pathways, such as the sirtuin pathways or the uh, the the AMP kinase or the down regulating mTOR all these things so so that is the idea now and you know caloric restriction you know even in humans it's not just an animal thing uh is shown also to significantly improve cardiovascular risk factors insulin sensitivity and mitochondrial function now caloric restriction doesn't really have any sort of time element tied to that and um and in that regard it's very different it's different from intermittent fasting i mean it's related but it's uh theoretically but it's intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding which we're just going to call uh we're just going to call that intermittent fasting in general and and just to clarify there's different ways to do this fasting and one is probably the most common way a lot of people are doing it is you know, to have a window like I do where it's, you know, six to eight hours where that's where you're taking calories. You don't take in calories the rest of that 24 hour window. Uh, others do it in other ways where they, you know, fast for 24 hours, like, you know, two days of the week and, and the other five are, you know, are just regular. So there's different ways to do this, but I'm going to lump them all into this uh, fasting thing um, that we're talking about today. Because uh, specifically, I think most people that I know who are doing uh, what we call intermittent fasting are typically doing uh, time-restricted feeding. In other words, in a window of approximately eight hours or less. So, so let's uh, let's go with that. Now, 
this whole concept of intermittent fasting has grown in popularity, as I mentioned, with me and with, you know, lots of people in the longevity space. And uh, as an alternative, ultimately, just to caloric restriction, because there's been data supporting its benefits, whether that's in weight loss, metabolic health. And what's interesting to note is that has been uh, something that has been seen even without the need for daily caloric restriction. In other words, caloric restriction, specifically looking at, you know, restricting calories and what what some of the studies uh, were showing, and a number of studies are showing, is that you could get at least the metabolic benefit. In other words, uh, whether it comes to blood glucose, um, you know, hemoglobin A1C levels, insulin sensitivity, all that, you could get that with uh, simply creating this window of eating rather than necessarily doing the full caloric restriction thing. So, of course, now that's kind of what we want, right? I mean, we want to have good metabolic health. And when I say metabolic health, again, I'm talking about insulin sensitivity, blood glucose, decreased inflammatory markers, that kind of thing. So the thing with caloric restriction that made intermittent fasting, um, I think, appealing more broadly as well is that you can see in multiple uh, studies that even the caloric restriction works really well that it's generally much harder and there's poor retention it's like there'd be studies of of people doing caloric restriction but you know yeah after a certain amount of time they just would relapse and right there was no kind of uh, whereas a window just made it just kind of interesting in other words so uh, the caloric restriction was not particularly palatable. So, and that is a bad pun, but you're welcome. Let me point out a few things here. Uh, One of the theories, and we'll just mention this quickly. I don't think it's something we want to go into too much of why intermittent fasting creates this metabolic health is because it, it, it tends to work with uh, the, our natural circadian rhythms of our bodies. The idea is kind of like you create less confusion about when the body should be building or having anabolic periods and, and when it should be uh, breaking down, um, having these catabolic periods. And so the idea is that metabolism and catabolism can become more efficient and that there's less confusion. And again, there's actually lots of benefits seen in animals and in human studies for intermittent fasting. I mean, animal studies, tons of them, uh, positive effects in white and brown adipose tissue, uh, the gut in mice uh, has helped prevent glucose intolerance and fatty liver uh, and and uh, improved lipid profiles. So like, you know, cholesterol profiles and all that. And again, when we're, what are we talking about here? We're talking about fatty liver. We're talking about glucose intolerance. We're talking about dyslipidemia, right? We're talking about ultimately all these things that lead into uh, what we call metabolic syndrome. And I've talked about metabolic syndrome and that disorder, I had I did an entire podcast on that, but metabolic disorder is a, um, a, a major sort of cause or I guess an amplifying uh, element to developing cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease. I, I would recommend that you, ha- I highly recommend you go back to that entire podcast on metabolic syndrome because I think that that is a, uh, one of the most important things that people don't really understand. But going back to intermittent fasting, you know, even in humans, there has been significant impacts from intermittent fasting on, you know, not only reducing uh, body weight, but also, again, uh, reducing fat, decreasing blood pressure, improving glucose levels, improving triglycerides and inflammatory markers. So, again, what is all this stuff? It's helping with metabolic syndrome, right? So bottom line is that the clinical research underpinning, you know, the effects of intermittent fasting, it it certainly does reveal a profound impact on metabolic health. That's great, right? Based on all this stuff, I and many others concluded that time restricted feeding, having a window, intermittent fasting, is uh, is a good idea. Uh, my window, by the way, again, is, you know, probably about six or seven hours. Um, and I will tell you this much, okay? I have been doing this for about, I don't know, two years. 
And there is no doubt, zero doubt in my mind that it has made me metabolically healthier. I, well, again, looking at my hemoglobin A1C is 4.7, which I'm quite happy with. You know, my inflammatory markers are way down. I've got great insulin sensitivity. But the thing is that I do want to point out that what I do is not simply just a window of six to seven hours. In my case, and I think in the case of most people who are doing this intentionally for the purpose of longevity, we are making sure that that window also is a healthy window, right? We're not like, okay, we're not taking that eight hour window and, you know, eating junk and a bunch of processed food. We're making sure that we get enough protein, which is a big one because in protein, if you have a window in six, seven hours, you, you, it's really hard to get enough protein. I mean, if we're talking about right now, I'm trying to uh, put on lean muscle mass and I need one gram per pound uh, protein in order to keep up with those demands. For me, that's 215 grams of protein, right? That's hard enough if you're not fasting. But if you are fasting, that is crazy hard without supplementation to do. And okay, so maybe you don't need a gram, but you're certainly, as you're aging, you're going to need even, I'd say, at least three quarters of a gram to avoid sarcopenia, you know, the breakdown of muscle, all these major problems that people run into. So anyway, my point is it's not just a window. I'm keeping my protein high. I'm keeping my carbs very low. In fact, right now I'm kind of, you know, in a keto phase, which is not something that I, I intend to do for a very long period of time. But right now I'm at like 20 grams or less of carbs per day. And, uh, and my metabolic numbers are fantastic. I'm putting on, you know, lean muscle and, uh, I've been lifting pretty intently for the last four months. I mean, I feel great, right? Um, my heart, uh, very healthy. I've had a CT angio. I don't really see any, anything to necessarily look at and say, you got to change this. Okay. Now let's talk about the study though, because this is a data driven show. Okay. I'm a data driven guy and it's important to pay attention when new data comes in, regardless of what your current dogma is. Okay. So in this uh, study, researchers investigated uh, the potential long-term health impact of following an eight-hour time-restricted eating plan, okay? So what they did, and this was a study that was presented uh, at, at an American Heart Association meeting recently. And uh, what they did is this was a retrospective study, which means as they went back and looked in time. So by nature, it is a correlative study, and it's, uh, you know, so it's, it's looking at trends. And so sometimes there's a lot of flaws with that, which we'll talk about in a second. But they looked at 20,000 patients, okay? And the way they did this is they reviewed information about dietary patterns for participants um, via this annual National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that was do that's done every year, obviously the annual they looked from 2003 to 2018, basically to get an idea about the people uh, who, you know, what, what people had, what kind of specific diets. And part of that they were able to obtain. Again, this is like surveys. So it's not like, you know, it's not like people who are, you know, strictly intending to go for uh, who are, are following what they think is a healthy window of eating. It's literally looking from 2000 three to 2018 in this random survey and saying, hey, how many hours of the day were you eating, right? And so out of that, they were able to identify like your typical, okay, these people were uh, eating for, eight, you know, eight hours or less. These people were eating for 10 hours or less. And then, you know, there was people munching into the middle of the night and eating for full 16 hours, you know, that kind of thing. So they compared that data that they got from that uh, survey to... Uh, the people who died in the U.S. in the same period of time uh, that was obtained from uh, the National Death Index database. Okay, so here are the, the, uh, the things that they noted. 
One, people who followed a pattern of eating all of their food across less than eight hours per day. Again, that is our, you know, typical, that's what we call the restrictive feeding, uh, the, the uh, uh, intermittent fasting when we're talking about uh, time-restricted feeding, eight hours per day. People who followed a pattern of eating all their food across less than eight hours per day had a 91% higher risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. In other words, people who were using this window at least, okay, that again, that's all we know. It's a window. People self-reporting to eat in this eight-hour window, eight hours or less, had twice the chance of dying of cardiovascular disease. Okay? That's one. Now, the increase of risk of cardiovascular disease was also seen in people uh, living with heart disease or cancer. So that's, you know, another thing they noticed. Uh, next thing they noticed, among people with existing cardiovascular disease, an eating duration of no less than 8, but less than 10. So somewhere between 8 and 10 hour uh, eating windows. They were also associated with 66% higher risk of death from heart disease or stroke. Okay, crazy, right? Time-restricted eating did not reduce overall risk of death from any cause. Okay, so that part, I'm not terribly surprised with that because, you know, in animal studies, it's always about caloric restriction. We don't, you know, the stuff that we've found in animals is, is a CR. It's not intermittent fasting. Okay, finally, an eating duration of more than more than 16 hours. Okay, that's basically like... <laughs> I mean, it's like eating like nonstop, right? Uh, was associated with a lower risk of cancer mortality among people with cancer. So, and there's probably a good reason for that. I mean, if people have cancer and they're wasting away trying to be able to like, even being hungry for that period of time is probably a good prognosis. So I'm not, I'm not terribly surprised about that one. Okay, so let's talk about this study. So what are the limitations? Well, first of all, uh, it was a, a correlative study, right? A retrospective and its correlations based on surveys. And correlation uh, does not equal causation. That's a, a really important point. You see that and sometimes you get misdirected information. Um, it was a study looking back at surveys and just connecting some things that uh, correlated. And there's... Um, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions also. I mean, well, first of all, like the eight-hour window people, again, they were not necessarily, you know, longevity types trying to do time-restricted feeding and making sure they were getting all their macronutrients and, you know, paying attention to protein and all that. I mean, these could have been people who had that eight-hour window because they were extraordinarily busy at work and didn't have time to eat, right? They could have been downing donuts uh, in the office. We don't know. Uh, we don't know any further breakdown of their diets. Um, and we, you know, did people who ate in the smaller windows uh, eat differently in terms of nutrient density? Uh, again, were they more likely to eat junk food? How about protein? Again, we talked, I just talked about protein quite a bit. Were these people, because they ate in those windows, not getting enough protein? We know that sarcopenia plays a major role in, in death in the elderly, uh, which could be exacerbated by inadequate protein levels. Finally, you know, this work has not actually been peer-reviewed or published yet. It's uh, it's just presentation data. Um, it's raw, and it hasn't gotten a lot of uh, feedback yet. There hasn't been anybody who's, like, really dove into the statistics and all that kind of thing, uh, it, you know, to, to, to challenge any of this. Uh, I'm not necessarily the guy to do that, so I'm just waiting for for some of these responses uh, and, and to see what people think. So that brings me to my take, okay? So how does this affect what I personally think? I'd love to tell you that I'm going to ignore the study because I've been telling you it's a good idea to, to, to eat in these windows um, really since we started this show. But here's the thing. Uh, regardless of all the limitations of this study, right, all of the things that we mentioned, 
you simply cannot ignore the fact that there was a, uh, not only that there was a correlation that resulted in um, um, more cardiovascular deaths in the eight hour restriction group, but the, it, it, it was twice as much, right? This wasn't like, oh yeah, it was like 15% more or something like that. Or, you know, like, like maybe there was just a little bit of difference and maybe there did reach, reach statistical significance. We're talking about twice as many cardiovascular deaths in the window people. And to me, that is data you simply cannot ignore. You can't ignore it. And that's really important. Again, if we're going to be a data-driven community, you don't, you, don't, you don't hold on to dogmas. And you don't say, well, they're wrong because I believe this, right? Um, just as an example, you know, people who are perfectly, um, you know, perfectly smart and, you know, looking at what they were supposed to do, right? We used to believe the food pyramid gave us the ideal diet, Right. And and now we know that it's more likely to give us diabetes. So I'm going to keep an open mind and continue to follow the story. Uh, in the meantime, I will tell you that I'm I'm going to probably loosen up my window a little bit and try to maintain um, you know the same level of caloric intake. After all, um, you know, again, all the longevity studies in the lab that show life extension involve caloric restriction, but again, not intermittent fasting, okay? The idea was that intermittent fasting was going to stimulate some of these longevity genes by sort of fooling the body into thinking we are starving. Well, that whole concept might just not be correct. But here's the thing. I would say that regardless of the long-term outcomes here in terms of seeing you know, more mortality, you know, the, the twice as much cardiovascular mortality. I don't think that necessarily means that it's not something you can consider doing in the short term. Again, there is plenty of data showing significant benefit in metabolic, uh, metabolic, uh, you know, if somebody has metabolic syndrome, this is probably something to help get out of that syndrome. Now, whether you continue to do this in perpetuity, in my view, is the question. In other words, this may, you know, intermittent fasting may be a, uh, an intervention that maybe you do for a period of time to get to a certain point, but it may not be something that you continue in the long term after you've kind of achieved certain goals. Maybe there's weight loss goals or maybe they're about insulin sensitivity and all that, you know? So... I've tried to think about this rationally because, again, you go out there and all these people are talking about fasting all the time, including me, but a lot of them are still fighting back awfully hard on this and calling this study a complete, you know, complete BS and that everybody who was doing the eight hours is obviously eating donuts. Well, what about the people who weren't doing eight hours? Does that mean they, they weren't eating donuts? And the, the people, like I know, I know Dave Asprey said that about donuts. I'm using this example. And, and in, to me, again, it's like a, you can't ignore that strong a data. We don't know. So here's my thought. Let's think of intermittent fasting again as an intervention. Let's think of it as a supplement, okay? If intermittent fasting was a supplement and a, and a study came out on the correlation of this supplement to, you know, maybe the supplement actually improves cardio, uh, uh, metabolic disease, but that supplement uh, showed that there was some correlation with t doubling your risk of cardiovascular disease. What would you do? Of course, you'd stop taking the supplement. You'd stop it at least until... Somebody could clarify that data because, again, you don't want to harm yourself with a supplement. That's a very good, I think, very good parallel because there's people taking supplements to do like, you know, to, for, for various uh, potential benefit as well, right? And most of the time, my rule of thumb on the benefit is 
for example, let's take taurine. I mean, I think there's some animal studies and all that that show that taurine might actually help with health span and longevity and all that stuff. And animals, maybe in humans, who knows? But the thing is, there's really no reason to believe that taurine as an amino acid really does anything bad to you. So it's okay to take, right? Here, what we're looking at potentially is that there's an intervention, namely this window, time, uh, uh, you know, the window of eating that all of us have been, a lot of us have been doing. And we are seeing data, correlative or either, that it may actually harm you in the long term. If that's the case, I think you got to like take it seriously. So again, am I going to recommend the eight hour window anymore? No, I'm not going to. I'm going to recommend potentially doing it for a short period of time, an intervention. But until we figure out, you know, more and follow up on the study, get some drilling down on this data, I can't in good faith continue to advocate for an eight hour or less window. Anyway, that's my that's my take on this. I'd love your feedback on this because man, this is um this is one of those things that it's like, you know, you got to have an open mind in life, right? And whether it's I you know, I talk a lot about investing and with investing it's like, okay, you always think you do the right thing, but a lot of times you're wrong and you have to change your trajectory. I mean, this is no different, right? Like you just you got to like keep going with what makes sense here, at, at least in, in what we're talking about, we have science that's, that is continuously giving us new and uh, updated information that we can act on. And, uh, that's what we have here. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that's helpful. Would, again, would love your feedback. Send me an email, buck at sapiopodcast.com. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. A quick reminder that while I am, in fact, a surgeon, nothing I say should be construed as medical advice. Now, make sure to include your physician in any medical decisions you make. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please make sure to show your support with a like, share, or subscribe. Until next time, this is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey.